Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tycon 2014 Sponsorship Chair, Saurabh Tandon. Hey, I'm Saurabh Tandon. I'm a volunteer and I'm, I'm the Sponsorship Chair for Tycon and, and also board member. It is absolutely fantastic. It is so fantafabulous. Is that a word? I'm just so happy, so it's okay. We have record sponsorship. I mean, we had fantastic sponsorship last year, but this year, wow. Sponsors, hats off to you guys. I know you have so many other conferences to go to, but you chose us, you came here. There's so much of marketing budgets and cuts going on everywhere. It's, it's a dollar's been extended. So it's, it's, just, it's from the bottom of the heart. And, and attendees for you guys, I mean, there's a reason the sponsors are here because they know the kind of talent which comes here. They know the kind of people, entrepreneurs who are here. They want to meet innovative companies. They want to meet uh, people they could invest in, they could license with, they could work with. There's a lot of requests coming to us also for hiring talent and, and kind of meeting the right people. So all of those reasons make it a great place to network, make the most of it. I mean, the sponsors are spending really, really big time dollars here. So have a great conference, have a lot of fun, network, be proactive. Don't just sit in that corner and not talk to anybody. Let's do that. Thank you so much. Have a great conference. Kill the flesh. Thank you so much and uh, welcome here. Uh, I'd like to once again thank the major sponsors here. And it's, it's absolutely, they have so many choices to go to, so many conferences, really appreciate it. It all started with uh, the grand and platinum level sponsors where IBM was the first one which came in. And that gave us the impetus, that gave us the momentum to do this. And they were very early, they came in as grand sponsors. I'd like to thank SAP also. For three years in a row now, they have been supporting us, both as grand and platinum, so it's a huge, huge validation for us. VMware as a new sponsor is extremely uh, important for us also. It's all, it's all kind of falling together. And on the platinum sponsors, I'd like to thank uh, Qualcomm. Again, they are uh, repeat sponsors. They, two years in a row, they are now doing that. And other than that, we have Citrix and Actian as new sponsors, again, at the platinum level, so really appreciate that. And we also have Trimble, which is again uh, coming in as, as a repeat sponsor. They were sponsors last year too, again at platinum level. So all of this is huge, and we really thank them a lot. Uh, we also have, uh, I'd like to thank the Thai staff here, which has been pretty key to kind of doing this, and beginning with uh, Ramesh Krishnan, the business development director here, and, and Raj Desai, the executive director. So they, they've been working on this for, for all through the year and kind of keep the momentum going. We'd also like to thank uh, my volunteers here, uh, Rishi, Protik, and Himali, and you'll be seeing them later also. And also the executive leadership which contributed here, quite a few of them, and that's Vivi Jagdish, Vish Mishra, and Wing Shukla, so all of, I mean, there's, there's a lot more also. So yeah, that's, uh, that's it from me. I don't want to take too much of time. You have not come here to listen to me. It's, it's more now, I'd like to introduce uh, Ray Wong. Ray Wong is the principal analyst, founder, and chairman of Constellation Research, Inc. He's also the author of the popular enterprise software blog, a software insider's point of view, with the viewership in the millions of pages. Uh, and Ray is also a prominent keynote speaker and a research analyst. He advises Global 2000 companies on business strategy and technology selection. Ray is also a regular contributor to Howard Business Review. Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome, Ray Wong. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? I'm going to talk really quickly about a quick set of trends, um, show a video, introduce our guests and fellow Fireside chat participants. But first of all, let's start with this thing. We are at the dawn of the digital business revolution. We're talking about digital transformation happening at a rate we've never seen before. And think about this. 52% of the Fortune 500 have turned. They've been merged, acquired gone off the list and now we've even gone bankrupt since 2000. We're talking a massive pace of change and at the center of this digital transformation is data and data is powering this revolution. Let's cue the video. IBM Watson is a technology unlike any that's come before because rather than force humans to think like a computer, Watson interacts with humans on human terms. Watson can read and understand natural language, like the tweets, texts, articles, studies, and reports that make up as much as 80% of the data in the world. 
A simple internet search can't do that. The IBM Watson Developers Cloud offers software vendors and developers the technology and tools they need to take advantage of Watson's cognitive power. Accessible on the cloud, anytime. Watson needs you. This generation of problem solvers is going to learn much faster with Watson, and Watson in turn will learn much faster with us. Developers will solve new problems, business leaders will ask bigger questions, and together we'll do things generations before couldn't dream of. What will you do with Watson? So before I introduce our two Fireside Chat guests, Mike Grodin, IBM Senior Vice President of Watson, and Manoj Saxena, who is the founding general partner of the Entrepreneurs Fund, a quick set of introductions. As you might know, Mike Grodin has been a veteran at IBM 30 years. He's in charge of one of the most important groups at IBM, which is Watson. And Manoj Saxena was the general manager of IBM Watson, now working closely with them as a special advisor. Please welcome on stage Mike Rodin and Manoj Saxena. Well, good morning. Morning. Good morning. So let's just start by talking about what is Watson and what isn't it? I'm going to start with you, Mike. Is this more than Jeopardy? Is this detailed? Where are we going with this? Yeah, I, I think that the best way to think about it is Jeopardy was a demonstration of a new class of technology, right? It wasn't the end state. It was actually just a glimpse of what's to come. I, I think at, at its core, if you, if you really you strip off the game playing aspects of, of what we did and look at what the technology was, it, you know, it simply it understands natural language. Uh, based on that natural language, it can generate hypotheses on questions that are posed, and it learns. And, and that really was the core of, of what the, the innovation was. But since then, it's gone through some pretty amazing, amazing uh, engineering and uh, market validation work. So this is software, services, apps, all around cognitive computing, which is a new class of technologies. Right, this is, this is really a, a new, we like to think of it as the beginning of a new era of computing. And, and that, that's a broad statement, right? Because there's really only been two eras before this. There was tabulating equipment, and then there was generally programmable computers, which is everything everyone in this room has ever used. These new systems are information-based as opposed to program-based. So when, when you start to think about how you work with Watson as opposed to program Watson, it's really about thinking about the problem you're trying to solve, the information that may be necessary to solve that problem, where you're gonna find the information, how you're gonna curate it, how you're gonna put it in a system, how you're gonna train the information. Once you have all that done, then you write the app, right? So it's a very different kind of uh, model. Now, Manoj, you've, been, you've put together a $150 million fund focused on these areas. I mean, what are some of the hot topics? What investments are going on that are in some of those four categories of investments you've put in? Sure. So if you look at it from a customer point of view, building on what Mike just said, uh, this is a, a, a very long shift in what computing is going to do for the masses, both on the consumer side and enterprise side. As a fund, we are looking at three different aspects as major themes. One is monetizing big data. Uh, so if we talk about big data a lot, but the reality is 80% of big data is unstructured data. It's data that machines today don't understand and can't process. So cognitive technologies like Watson are the ideal tool to start creating big value out of big data. Right now, big data is not delivering a big, 52% of the projects in big data are failing because people aren't able to get value. So that's one theme. The second part is there is an entire new class of enterprise and B2B and B2C apps that are going to come about using cognitive technology uh, in industries ranging from education to travel to law. So we're looking at vertical applications of Watson where we can drive outcomes and uh, you know, benefits for both consumer and the enterprise. And last but not the least, I think the entire infrastructure is getting reconfigured. The whole stack is getting reconfigured. So as you start looking at the class of systems that cognitive systems are, Cognitive computing delivers probabilistic applications. Programmable, programmable computing gave you deterministic application. So if you ask Watson, what's two plus two? It'll say 99.5% sure it's four. <laughs> I'm 47% sure it's the configuration of a car. And I'm 30% sure it's the definition of a family, mother, father, and two children. <laughs> so, so, so the ability for 
machines to give you answers that are Bayesian, are probabilistic in nature, uh, is going to reconfigure the entire stack from how you process information, how you deliver information, how you learn from the information. So those are the three themes in which we're investing. And we've built for a transactional age, not for this type of engagement right. and sense and respond. One of the facts that we've seen in the past is 90% of all the data has been created in the last two years, and 80% of it is unstructured. How does Watson go about this? Well, you know, it goes back to what I said a minute ago. It's about understanding natural language. So um, when, we, when the researchers worked on Watson, they actually thought about it from the perspective of how we learn, how our children learn, right? So um, if you think about uh, our, our kids, in, how they learn in school is they're given a book. They read the book or they read an article, they read something. Once they read it, how do we know that they actually understood it? You ask them questions, right? And you go through the learning process. And then the way you really know they understood it is you give them a blind test called an exam, right? Where they walk in and have to answer questions that they've never seen before to really apply the technology or the techniques that was in the material that they read. Um, that's the way Watson works, it reads. It reads all the information we give it. It doesn't get tired of reading. It really likes to read. Uh, it can read hundreds of millions of documents and start to correlate the information, build ontologies on the fly based on its understanding of the information. But just like, uh, just like we have to deal with uncertainty, Watson has to deal with uncertainty as well. So when you think about it, when you read a new book, right, and that new book contradicts all the things you thought you knew, you become uncertain for a while until you sort out in your own head what that new information means, right? Same thing happens with Watson. When Watson reads a new book, um, its level of confidence and answers you know, goes through a momentary kind of you know, re-leveling, right? And in fact, it may come back and say, you know, based on this information, it could be this answer, and based on this information, it could be this answer, right? But the thing that it does that no computer system has done before is it allows you to ask the why question. You know, that five-year-old question you have when your kids are learning and they ask why about yeah. everything? You can ask Watson why it thinks this is the right answer, and it will actually show you the relevant passages from the documents it used to generate that hypothesis. That's actually something that's transformative. So it automatically sources that information so then you can go and look at it and then make another judgment again. Exactly, it's informed judgment. So we're taking data, the mass quantities of structured, unstructured information, bringing that together inside information and business processes, pulling out to the insight level, right. and then being able to ask questions against that insight to ultimately get to a decision. Right. When we, when we went through, um, over the last couple of years, and Manoj led this for me when, uh, when he was with, was with us, we went through a period of market validation, right? So we started working with uh, two primary industries to look at what are the use cases for this kind of technology. One you would expect us to work on, which was financial services, right? IBM stronghold in, in, uh, in the enterprise. But the other one was healthcare. But working on healthcare from an angle no one would have really thought of, which is actually working with the doctors directly. Right? The doctors had a problem. They saw something in the game show that gave them a glimpse of a possible solution, right? and they came to us and said, we need to work with you. We, don't, we know it doesn't do what we need today, but we think the journey that we're going to go on is going to change how medicine is practiced. Right? And the problem they're facing is we're still training them the same way we have. Your, your wife is a doctor, right? Yes. She went through med school. She had to learn all this reference material. She had to prove she, rec you know, she remembered how to deal with it by being an intern and a resident. Uh, go through sleep deprivation activity to, to, to prove that she can recall it in, uh, uh, under trying circumstances. Then she graduated and went into practice, right? And when she went into practice, she started seeing, you know, what, six, seven patients an hour, right? Um, has two to three minutes to prepare in between each patient, right? Then you look at what the IT industry did to healthcare, right? We created electronic medical records, hundreds of pages of information about that patient. Somewhere in that two to three minutes, she has to ingest that 200 pages of electronic medical records. It's not happening. Then you compound that with clinical trials, with drug trials. It's becoming impossible to keep up with the information. And then the straw that breaks the camel's back for doctors is low-cost DNA sequencing and genomic medicine. They're not trained how to read it. They don't know how to apply it. And they have to correlate that information to everything else they know. They need help. right? And that's what these technologies are going to start to be able to do. And all the conflicting studies that are happening as well. So that's yep. happening in the market. It's, now, you said healthcare was one of these areas. I noticed that you guys were also in travel and even in cooking. 
Right. Uh, that, well, that, uh, that starts to get into a lot of what we're here to talk about today, which is an ecosystem, right? We, we recognize that, you know, IBM is going to work on, you know, big enterprise kind of transformation projects. That's what we do, right? We have a lot of enterprise clients that are going to look at for repeatable solutions that uh, are going to work on things like call centers, et cetera. And, and those are kind of things you would expect us to do. Uh, but when Manoj and I were working together in the, the back half of last year, we recognized that to bring cognitive computing to the masses, IBM's not going to do that, right? You're going to do that. The people in this room are going to be the ones that come up with the ideas. They're going to start to build the applications that go to the consumer marketplace. They're going to build the next generation of enterprise applications. So what we did is launch the Watson ecosystem in the Watson Developer Cloud uh, in fourth quarter of last year. We initially opened it up for um, entrepreneurs. Uh, last month, we opened it up for corporate developers, creating sandboxes for the thousands of developers that our large corporations have to start working on their next generation of in-house applications. And then last week, we opened it up to seven of uh, you know, some notable universities uh, around the US, uh, Carnegie Mellon, RPI, NYU, Michigan, Ohio State, UT Austin, and Berkeley. Right, some of the uh, great universities, great artificial intelligence programs are going to be teaching classes on how to build solutions on top of Watson. So think of it as training for the next generation of entrepreneurs. They're going to come out of college knowing what they need to do to start bringing ideas to the market on this kind of technology. Now that's on top of the billion dollar investment IBM's made, the hundred million dollar fund I think you're advising on Manoj. What are some of the areas in that hundred million dollar fund that you're looking at uh, that are important that people out here might be thinking about startups for? Yeah, so um, just to build on what Mike said, in November when we announced the Watson Cloud and the Watson ecosystem, uh, one of the things IBM also announced was a hundred million dollar fund, a Watson ecosystem fund to promote startups to start building applications. And then I left after that to create uh, a fund, an independent fund, which invests now side by side, uh, looking at opportunities um, together with IBM. One of the pieces that we have seen is, again, deep verticalization is, is a one area, so areas like legal, um, areas like you know, going into finance and stuff like that, that's one. The other part is consumer applications. Uh, IBM's very interested in building a robust uh, ecosystem of consumer applications. As, as a VC now, I'm looking you know, very aggressively in the B2C space to come up with new types of online services that are cognitive in nature, not keyword in nature, right? So if you were to ask a computer, I want to go to south of France with my daughter and stay at a four-star hotel which has activities for kids and is not too far away from the beach, what do you recommend? Rather than go through drop-drop boxes and, you know, things. so travel, one of the biggest industries, education, healthcare, uh, there's a lot of consumer-facing applications here that uh, my fund is looking at. And uh, last but not the least, uh, the entire stack, if we think cloud is reconfiguring the stack, cognitive is going to reconfigure the stack even more. Right, and right now we are just pull pulling together what I call as a compute infrastructure in the cloud. The next wave is going to be putting analytics in the cloud. So we're looking at uh, companies that does that as well. As, one, as an one, of the, uh, one of the great uh, local companies that we started working with right off the bat was a company in, uh, up in San Francisco called Fluid. And what, what Fluid is, was looking at is they looked at the capabilities, you know, their core business was e-commerce, right? They built some great e-commerce systems for some of the, the great brands like North Face, et cetera. And they started looking at this e-commerce or this uh, Watson capability and said, you know what's missing from e-commerce is it's catalog shopping. Right. You, you go online and you're going through a catalog, right? You're missing that personal shopper, that person that knows you the person that can help walk you through what you need for a particular trip you're going on or what you need to put in. And, and we all know that personal shopper that picks you up at the door at Nordstrom's, they're very good at putting more in your shopping cart than you may have gone in for in the first place. So from a business viewpoint, this idea of the personal shopper on the front end of e-commerce is going to be great for the consumer, but it's also going to be great for the business on the back end. So that's just a great application of a, of a retail solution built for B2C. Right. We were talking about this earlier, about mass personalization at scale, right. one of the things that Watson can do really well. Um, what other applications are you seeing that level of personalization come up, both in consumer and in enterprise? So I think uh, one of the massive frontiers for monetization after healthcare is education. Okay, uh, one of the major areas that I see being transformed by cognitive technologies in the next five, seven, ten years is uh, how education is delivered. So areas like Khan Academy and all, they're generating massive amounts of content, but it is still, you have to go through, as Mike said, through catalogs and stuff to figure out. 
Imagine having a Watson guiding you based on who you are across your whole career. It's, it's uh, learning across your life and having a coach that guides you, whether it's learning on your business stuff or your school stuff, or to get my tennis swing right, or, or to get the turn nine on that apex, you know, how to hit on a race car, and getting a machine to sort of start helping you guide through it. What, what I, I think tell, that's a big front. Um, what I tell my teams, Ray, uh, is that, you know, as, as they think about business development, look for two things. I want you to look for um, industries and professions that have massive amounts of unstructured information being produced at record pace, right? So you've got this mountain of information being produced, and that information typically has to be manually processed by highly paid professionals. If you find that intersection, medicine, law, those are great places to look to start business. Accounting businesses. as well. Accounting, Accounting, right? Anything where the information is the regulatory environment, the legal environment, the state, local, federal, international legal environments, massive amounts of, of policy-based regulatory information, case law, you know, it's a great space to start looking at how to turn those businesses, those models upside down so that you can start to disrupt and create that next generation, that next wave of innovation in the market, right? We, we saw, we saw this kind of transformation once before. It was in the 60s, right? It goes way back, right? If you think about banking in the 50s and the 40s, right? It was big books of ledgers of rooms full of accountants and bookkeepers that kept track of everything. Transaction processing and modern uh, generally programmable computers in the mainframe completely automated the world's financial systems, brought it together, and it created an explosion of, of transformation that occurred over decades is still occurring today. Right? We see that happening to different industries now, like, uh, like healthcare, like, uh, like law. Those are going to go through massive transformations. Now, those are some interesting examples of what's shifting. What other big data business models that are emerging from this? Because there's a whole set of new business models that are going to change as you collapse that, uh, what's traditionally been manual, intensive, uh, regulatory well, type of work. Uh, think, about, uh, think about information as IP, right? Uh, you know, IP-based businesses around the, the creation of content and how that content is being used, right? Uh, content really becomes the fuel for this next generation of transformation. These cognitive systems live off this fuel, right? So I see business models starting to emerge around how information-centric companies are going to find new ways to monetize the information they have, whether they use cognitive technologies to create new services off the information they deliver themselves, or whether they monetize the content and delivering it to entrepreneurs that then create new applications off of that. So Manoj, will the world of trading networks come back? Oh, absolutely. I think it never went away. Actually, if you look at um, the trend we're going through now, driven by mobile and cloud versus what we did you know, 20 years ago right. with the web. I mean, I've never been this excited about IT, uh, say for 1996 when I saw Mosaic for the first time, right? I knew this was going to change the world. I think the next five to 10 years are going to be more, most exciting in terms of disruption and innovation, driven by the confluence of these big five trends on big data, mobile, cloud, analytics, and social. And when you start looking at how to apply that, um, the global trading web, what was it? It was a transactional web. Yes. Right, this is a vision back to the commerce one and the Reba days. Uh, but now, uh, to build on what Mike said, if you look at information as a service and information as IP, how do you facilitate liquidity of information? Right. So it's a global information web and with monetization models on top of it. So how do you source it? How do you process that information? And how do you deliver the information? There are new business models for all of those. So do you see a world where we're no longer selling products anymore or services, but the data and the information inside those organizations are going to be worth more than the products they I sell. think they're already there. I think uh, in many cases, I would argue that um, you know, today, you know, information and brand experience drives customer buying and pre preference a lot more than the product itself. Well, one of the things I think is important here is that you've got to recognize that this new class of technology, this cognitive technology, is probabilistic, right? Which means it's not always going to be right. It's going to provide advice, but just like anybody you get advice from in this room or anywhere else, you've got to apply judgment to that advice. And what we really believe is that this new era is going to be characterized by a combination of human and machine working together to work on problems that neither one could solve independently. That's what's really exciting about this. We're going to be able to, after, to go after new types of problems that machines can't do by themselves, people can't do by themselves, but together they've got a shot at it. That's actually a great point. So white collar work as we know it will change, but it won't go away. Right. We're just getting 
we're clearing through all the junk that well, was if you, keeping if you, us. If you go back to my example earlier on the financial system, right? We, we automated a lot of the bookkeeping, but financial services employment went up, not down, right? We created entire yeah. new industries around international trade, around how the monetary authorities work, how, the, you know, how that started to link with the retail industry, the transportation industry. Whole new industries were created as a result of that automation, and the same thing's gonna happen here as these new systems come online. It's the, it's the notion of machine augmented cognition. Right. right? If you really look at, even um, you know, IBM did the deep blue before, Watson, the grand challenge was Deep Blue. Right, right. the big it chess was, match. The big chess yeah. match where the machine beat Gary Kasparov. But if you followed it, and if you saw how the game of chess changed over the next 10 years, what you found was grandmasters kept coming out at a younger and younger age, and you really understood why is it that there were so many more grandmasters, and why were they younger? Because this younger generation was able to use a machine to train themselves yes. and pay the game much faster and better so you saw that happen already. It's not something new, right. but in, in areas where machines augmented chess playing, now imagine machines augmenting things around how you process information for financial services or run your chemical plants or start looking at trading or looking at uh, cancer diagnosis. All of this is available. So, so just, just to help the audience think about you know, the kinds of areas to look at it, investment, right? The, the, the kinds of applications to think about. We, we, we've recognized that there's three patterns that are just recurring in, in industries all over the place. One is around this idea of engagement. How to use cognitive technologies to help customers engage with their clients, right? right? How do they engage with their customers? How do they build a relationship, that knowing relationship that can extend beyond that once in the store experience, right? Um, that's a piece of it, right? How does the doctor know the patient better, et cetera? Right, so the, this idea of engagement, right? The second is discovery. How do you find the needle in the haystack? How do you find out which drugs that may already exist apply to a particular cancer type based on a particular uh, DNA sequence of that tumor, right? That's an example. How do you find out which drugs have been created before, which chemical combinations have been tried, which ones haven't? So this is an area of discovery and disco discovery technology, very different than search. And then the third, the third one that we see a lot is, is back to this idea of policies and regulations. How do you actually take unstructured information and automate the flow of approvals around unstructured information, whether it's insurance forms or pre-approvals for uh, medical procedures, and automate that against the policies that make sense to make sure it makes sense both from medical science as well as from the insurance policies uh, viewpoint. So I think you're giving people in the room a lot of ideas of what the possibilities could be inside this broader ecosystem. Um, it might help them understand what it doesn't do. What doesn't Watson do and what would some of these cognitive technologies not be able to, problems that they might not be able to solve at this point in time? Well, it, it, you know, it doesn't predict the future, right? It's, so it's I can't not, predict the future. This no. isn't going to tell me what stocks to buy, no. whether the Yankees are going to win, no, how the 49ers will do. And, and it's not a step on the way to Skynet either, right? This, this is a system that, that understands the world around us. It understands the information. It's starting to perceive who it's working with, right? We're getting information about the people that are using the system. One of the new capabilities that, that's going into the platform right now does um, you know, dynamic psycholinguistic profiling of the user. So we can actually get a 52-point personality uh, profile on you when you use the system because you're a prolific tweeter, right? So I can go out to Twitter and blogs and pull the information, and based on the language you use, I know about you, I know the kinds of things you use, so therefore I can figure out why you might be asking a question so I can give you a better answer, right? So those kind of perce perception capabilities are coming in. Uh, new relational technologies or relating technologies are starting to happen so that we can start to relate with you in different ways. It becomes conversational. It's not a question and an answer anymore. It's a conversation, a dialogue. It includes context and clarification back and forth. Important new elements coming into the system. And then finally, we're moving into the area of reasoning, right? As opposed to just answering a question, what if I give you a problem? What if you give me a one-page description of a problem and I can tear that apart, ask all the important questions, and come back with a set of recommendations on how you can start to progressively solve that problem. Those are the new capabilities going to the platform as we speak. Wow, so this is, for our audience, this is much more than big data. This is the future of where computing is going. Manoj, quickly, how do people get involved? You're the special advisor to the fund. How do they get involved, people I guess out the here? The easiest way is to go you know, Google Watson Ecosystem. It's ibmwatson.com slash ecosystem. Um, we've gotten already over 2,000 applications for, and, and they, they're coming in, you know, dozens and hundreds, I think, are coming in every month now. 
So um, you know, start looking at also videos. There's a lot of YouTube videos on different applications of Watson. And I think lastly, the patterns that Mike talked about, engagement, discovery, and policies, I think those are good areas that IBM's already validated for you all. So go deeper into that. And you guys are hosting a workshop, I believe, at the uh, Mission City Ballroom in M1 at 145 to 445 today. Yep. So please join them there. Um, please thank our guests here, Mike Rodin, Manoj Saxena. Thank you. Thank you.